are these people? Let's talk about Rishi for okay. a second. Um, not our Richie, but the other Richie. Not our Richie. Not the one that we love, Richie Mentors, but mm. Rishi Sunak, of whom is tutored in the media as the first Indian or of color prime minister in the UK. I'm sure that's what they're going to be leaning with probably for the next week or so. But there's some things that we should probably know about this guy. Um you know, and I know some of you in the chat have already hinted as to what that is, but some of those things are, but, you know, but just to educate ourselves a little bit, uh, especially since it is our major, one of our major allies uh, right across the pond. But this article, I believe, is actually a little older than the date, uh, but I think they just reintroduced it now in light of him, you know, essentially getting, um, you know, becoming prime minister this week. But written by Adam by Ch Chosky, uh, from well, I think this article was originally from OpenDemocracy.net, uh, but I pulled it from Common Dreams. The many things Rishi Sunak doesn't want you to know, from offshore dealings to right-wing think tanks, here's our guide to the man who will become the UK's richest prime minister. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, reportedly the richest P MP in Parliament will be a boon for the financial lobby, tax justice campaigners have warned. The man trenched by Liz Truss just weeks ago, well, days ago, has been confirmed as her replacement with the exit of Penny Mordaunt from the Tory leadership contest. But experts say Sunak has not been transparent with his finances and that his hedge fund background raises questions about his commitment to fighting tax avoidance. His early profile has risen, risen sharply since he became chancellor in early 2020, just weeks before the first lockdown began. But critics say a slick public marketing campaign has disguised a man with ultra-privileged background who is a committed patriarchy ideologue. So this is a tweet uh, that he posted uh, last winter um, when he became chancellor. Uh, Growing up, I never thought I would be in this job, mainly because I wanted to be a Jedi. I'm honored that on this day last year, the PM asked me to serve as chancellor. It's been incredibly tough, but thank you to everyone who has supported me along the way. So you want to scroll down? Shows a cute little picture of him, you know, when he was a boy. And now, and a couple over a year ago, you know, growing up. I'd rather have outside. the cat that sits outside that door. A lot. What? Uh, there's a there's a cat that sits outside that door all the time that I'd rather have as PM. Oh, you know? true. <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, so this message carefully tiptoed around his privileged upbringing. Until the age of eleven, Sunak attended Oakmont Preparatory School and then the Shroud Independent Prep School, the lab of which now charges fees up to eighteen thousand five hundred pounds a year. From there, he studied at King Edward the Se the sixth school in Southampton, now 17,000 pounds a year, before moving to Winchester College, now 43,335 pounds a year. Five chancellors and one prime minister have attended Winchester, one of England's oldest public boarding schools and a long living rival of Eton before Sunak. So those of you know might know Eton's basically where the elite royals, especially, you know, have gone to school. So basically the one of the the elite school uh uh preparatory school in the uk for those who don't know sunak's tweet made me smile said richard beard an author whose latest book sad little men private schools and the ruin of england assesses the private education system and the many politicians that have been through it the idea that while studying in winchester college he would have never thought he would be at the top of government is very unlikely to me Leadership qualities are one of those things that they teach you and you're bound to think you're of your future in those terms. So he definitely would have so he would definitely have thought that this is the kind of job that he'll be in, even if he didn't explicitly think of Chancellor of the Exchequer. In media profile, Suna, Sunak's allies describe him as immaculate, calm, and organized, qualities befitting of a former Winchester head of college. Non-volunteer that he is empathetic or compassionate. When given examples of people who are experiencing hardship in Parliament or press interviews, as he was on Good Morning Britain last year, 
Sunak lists policies in response, but offer no con consolations. Beard, whose book is partially based on his own experiences, believes all male boarding schools emotionally harm their students. To survive, he says, boys cannot show any vulnerability among their peers. If you repress your emotion for yourself, then ultimately it becomes very easy to repress the feelings of, of for other people, he argues. And while boarding schools like Winchester may prepare students well to advance in, po in politics, Beard says they instill a worldview that is far from ordinary. Money is at the center of it all because everyone knows it costs a lot of money, including the boys, but the actual money is abstract. The needs of everyday life are simply taken care of for you, said Beard. How can you actually then think in terms of people struggling for five pounds and 10 pounds? So, okay, so number one, he cuts benefits. Last year, Sunak was heavily criticized for axing a, 30, a 20 pound a week increase to universal credit that had helped some of the poorest families for the pandemic. More than 200,000 would have been pushed into poverty as a result of the cut, according to research by the Joseph Mounchi Foundation. Just weeks before the cut was confirmed in July, the chancellor requested planning permission to build a private swimming pool gym, and tennis court at a grade two listed Yorkshire Manor that Sunak and his wife, Ashita Murti, purchased for 1.5 million pounds in 2015. After several MPs from his own party spoke out against the universal credit cut, Sunak increased with in increased in-work benefits in his autumn budget, but not by enough to offset the cut. Number two, he has a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The Sunak's Georgian mansion, where locals described attending probably parties with library staff who are sharing pain from magnums, is not the only property they own. There is also the £7 million five-bedroom house in Kensington, West London, a flat also in Kensington that the couple reportedly keep just for visiting relatives, and an apartment in Santa Monica, California. The Chancellor's extensive portfolio, property portfolio is just one source of his wealth. After studying at Oxford, Sunak went on to work for U.S. investment bank Goldman Sachs for four years. He left to pursue a business degree at Stan Stanford University in California, where he said being influential figures in the multi-billion U.S. tech industry left a mark on him. From there, Sunak had a stint working at hedge funds back in London. He was a partner at the Children's Investment Fund where he's believed to have made millions of pounds from a campaign to help trigger the 20 to 2008 financial crisis. Sir Chris Hone, the founder, the fund's founder, paid himself a record one, 343 million pounds in the first year of the pandemic. TCI is ultimately owned by a company registered in the Cayman Islands, according to its accounts. Its philanthropic arm, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, donated 255 million pounds to charitable causes last year. Full disclosure, Open Democracy has received funding from ICIFF since 2019. Thank you for the accountability there. Mm -hmm. Sunat then left to co-found his own firm, Thaleem, Thaleem, I guess that's how you say it, which had an initial fund of 536 million pounds and is also registered in the Cayman Islands. Yeah, Where are sure Three or yeah, offshore accounts. Three or three or four. I think it's four now. Mm. His financial interests aren't very transparent. The Cayman Islands are one of the world's top offshore tax and secrecy havens. When an investment is made through a hedge fund in the Caymans, no one can possibly know where that money has come from, said Alex Corbin, the chief executive of the Tax Justice Network. Not all the money that goes for the Caymans is dirty, and hedge funds argue that they need to keep their investment strategy secret to be competitive. Nevertheless, it is probably the best, certainly the most reputable way of allowing fairly questionable money in large volume to go into mainstream financial markets, said Cabo. An estimated $483 billion uh, a year is in cross-border tax abuse by multinational companies and by individuals hiding assets in havens like the Cayman Islands, according to the Tax Justice Network. Somehow in the financial sector, we still have this idea that it's basically um, smart to game the system. If these, then, uh, if these are the people and the culture that is coming into public life, then we got a real problem, said Colin. 
When Sunak became a minister in 2019, he placed the investments he held from his years of working in finance into a blind trust. Such agreements are intended to avoid conflicts of interest by handing over control of assets to a third party, but wherever that works in practice is questionable. These trusts don't necessarily come with any legal mechanism to prevent the owner of the assets actually dictating what happens, or indeed seeing through any claimed blindness, to call them. If politicians were willing to make the arrangement transparent, including in legal documents, we might have some confidence in that PS. Sunak has declared the trust in his entry on the registry of ministers' financial interests, but not the contents of it. The rest of his disclosures are remarkably minimal with for a man with an estimated net worth of 200 million pounds. Aside from the trust, he has listed his London flat and the fact his wife, Ashta Murti, owns a venture capital investment company, Hatcher Ventures, which the couple founded together in 2013. Murti, who Sumac met at Stanford, is the daughter of Indian billionaire N.R. Nar Narahanya Murti, who co-founded the IT company Infosys. Her shares in that firm are worth over 400, uh, worth 430 million pounds and, alone. Yeah. A fortune larger than the Queen's and enough to make her one of the richest women in Britain. The Murti, Murti family, Narahanya's children have dropped the H from their name, wonder why, mm. is reportedly to have invested part in their wealth through Catatrum and Vectors, though how much is unclear. Sunak resigned his directorship from the company in 2015. You should have just put an F instead of a TH. You know? mm. Well, my guess is they did that not to make their name so Indian. That's probably mm. my guess. Gotcha. Um, I think um, there's someone. I mean, M-R-P-H-Y. Maybe, you know? yeah. But I think, yeah, it's just a way to anglicanize the name. Name. Um, to make it sound more. So his wife, know. his wife already has a larger like yes fortune than the queen. Yes. Okay, and then him on top of that, he's probably ridiculous. Yes. You know. Okay. Yes. Nothing so, like the rich ruling our planet. Yay. Yay. Yes. Non-elected. Non-elected. Yeah. Billionaires, basically, ruling okay. the UK. So a, a monarch in another. Okay. Just making sure mm -hmm. we gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, people in the chat, you know what this is about. But I think this is very significant given that, you know, like Trump is questionable. Like Trump is rich, but not this rich, mm. you know, like relatively. So like, but, uh, but I think just really the idea, like, especially given right now what's happening in the UK, you know, like, you know, it's very unlikely that this guy is going to do anything for the working class, especially given that he has said with Liz Truss's, you know, financial plan was basically like, oh, I think according to him, a fairy tale of just how it basically or pr practically tanked, you know, the country financially. So, uh, but then also keep in mind, this is a guy originally that the Tories wanted um, to have before, like when Boris got ousted, you know, but then Liz Trust, you know, essentially won, you know, the nomination within the party. So to be uh, prime minister. So, so this is the original guy. So there's no question. Well, you know, we'll have to see what happens, but you know, but given that, you know, this man is loaded already, um, you know, so Rick Solis, you know, is saying the UK finally became a real oligarchy. Welcome to the club. Yeah, well, you can argue they've been that way for a while, but, you know, especially with this guy, you know, like, you know, like, yeah, he's worth more than the queen. Well, the king at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like this. This is not good for the UK. Um, no. So number five, I believe we're at now. He has strong links to right-wing think tanks. Soon I purportedly led the Hawks within the cabinet who opposed taking action when scientists recommended a circuit breaker lockdown, excuse me, in the summer 2020, arguing that restrictions would be too economically damaging. 
Johnson, Johnson delayed the decision and infectious spiral leading into a more punitive and lengthier lockdown in November. Sunak's been the voice most consistently pushing for watering down of COVID restrictions in the cabinet. So if you like, he's a kind of a logical continuation that of Thatcherite impulse within the Tories, mm. said Phil Burton Cartledge, the author of Falling Down the Conservative Party and the Decline of Tory Britain. Ooh. Ouch. Oh, hold on. Did I skip? No. Mm, no. Okay. Soon after becoming a v MP in 2015, Sunak wrote a report calling for the creation of free ports around the UK for the right-wing think tank Center for, Poli Center, Center for Policy Studies, which was co-founded by Margaret Thatcher. The policy idea that tax-free deregulated outposts we revitalized post-industrial coastal cities was finally tried by the former PM in the 1980s before successfully but being dropped by David Cameron in 2012 after proving unsuccessful. Sunak also worked with another right-wing think tank, Policy Exchange, which, like CPS, does not declare its donors before becoming an MP, and has spoken at the Institute of Economic Affairs since becoming a chancellor. All three think tanks have been consistently ranked among the least transparent in the UK. Number six, he has a slick PR operation. During the pandemic, million, billionaires such as N.R. Narata Murti saw their wealth increase. Murti's fortune was up 35% to £2.3 billion, billion in 2021, Christ. while inequity became the rich between the richest and the poorest group. What then explains the semi popularity of a former hedge fund manager like Sunak at a time in the midst of a cost of living crisis? Part of the answer might be the way Sunak has presented himself. Unusually for a chancellor, he hired the co-founder of a social media agency to manage his public image after he was appointed. Since then, the content of his social media channels, from casual Ask Me Anything style YouTube videos to puppy pictures on Instagram, have more closely resembled a celebrity influencer than a forerunner for a Tory leader. Jonathan Dean, an associate professor of politics at Leeds University, says this reflects broader political trends. Forms of celebrity are increasingly prominent within politics, and that can either take the form of people who were conventionally celebrities entering electoral politics, or it can take the form of politicians trying to eat the publicity and performance traditionally associated with celebrity culture. Sound familiar? Yep. Politicians draw on tactics from the world of celebrity influences, Dean suggests, partially because they can master political views. A lot of politicians that don't have a particularly coherent or well thought through set of ideological commitments or kind of policy ideas. And I think certain forms of celebritization allow them to circumvent that, he said. Hmm. Mm. Let me read that again. A lot of politicians don't have a particularly coherent or well thought, uh, thought out through set of ideological commitments or kind of policy ideas. And I think certain forms of celebritization allow them to circumvent that. Thoughts We're on that, we, Well, not even that, but it's just like... Yeah, accurate. We've been see, we've been, it's accurate, and we've been seeing this. You know, like... Like, you know, I think you can see you see this all the time, but I think especially with like the squad or AOC, I think we talked about Corey and her book a couple of weeks ago. We talked about AOC and nauseam, but I think even in some senses, you know, like Chris Smalls in some way kind of fits in this, too. You know, I think Chris Smalls is better in a sense of, you know, he actually initially kind of stood for something, you know, I think in some type of ideology he had 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 working for Amazon, but I think we we made the argument um in our stop site article and then our stream out based from that, you know, um that he's kind of moved away, you know, from more of the activism side of it, seemingly more so to more of the celebritization of I wouldn't call it activism, but more the celebritization of presenting yourself more as an influencer rather than an activist. So, yeah. So I think, yeah, basically... I mean, know, all of that. Like, activists, politicians, 
labor leaders like i mean where is this not being used to like squash actual change right that tactic so, right there right so but i think it's the argument you know like we love celebrity so mm -hmm. you know if they say nice tweets or if they have or say mean tweets polished, or say like yeah or even mean yeah, yeah. Mean, mean tweets in the case of Trump, you know, but like mm -hmm. send tweets, you know, have like a YouTube channel or Instagram and like just become more of an influencer and you know, dress nice, you know, say the right thing. And that just basically hides that can hide a lot of the ide ideology or if you have assuming you have any on what your real objective is. And in many cases, as we definitely seen in politics here and definitely in the UK too, it's just like a lot of empty slates who are doing the bidding of corporations and, you know, and, you know, big banks. And it seems like Sunat, like in a lot, of, in, in every way kind of fits this bill at probably a lot more dangerous because he had some money to back it up too. So, you know, so like, you know, I think it's almost kind of scary that he has that much money in access to him that he's basically able to do whatever he wants and no one can really say anything to him necessarily so um but anyway keep moving on uh in sunak's case it seems he has been even more successful in influencing journalists than the public a picture of him working from home in a hoodie became a media frenzy after columnists from vogue and gq commented his looks which in turn spot mockery on social media. It wasn't long after that Sunak was being asked how he felt about being described as dishy rishy in an interview with Lad Bible. While Sunak may be the most popular Tory politician among the public, among party members, he is second to the foreign secretary Liz Truss, his main rival for Tory leader if Johnson goes. Again, yeah, remember this was an old article. Burned College suggests that, th that this might be because he was not demonstrating the same zeal as trust for pursuing a war on woke, quote unquote. Uh, he is that of the same mold as Cameron, economically fatuite but socially liberal, said Burton College. Mm. That said, I can't see him throwing, throwing back on the tough rhetoric about migrants in the channel. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, so we actually have a clip, I forgot her name, but another MP, um, I think she's in labor, uh, in like part of the labor party who basically, you know, calls him out, basically saying this article in basically two minutes. So, right. uh, yeah. if you want to help play that for me. Rishi Sunak, the wealthiest member of parliament, is totally unfit to be prime minister. He is someone who has benefited from an elite education, going to a private school, Oxford, having a career in banking before pursuing a career in politics. So as prime minister, whose interests do you think he'll be serving? Rishi Sunak and his family belong to a very exclusive club who think the rules don't apply to them, including tax rules, benefiting from a non-dom status that you can't use. Taxation rules are something you don't have a choice about. Don't expect someone who has benefited from millions of pounds in tax being dodged to crack down on tax avoidance. Rishi Sunak's campaign video featured his parents migrating to the UK and telling a British success story. Family is everything to me, and my family gave me opportunities they could only dream of. But it was Britain, our country, that gave them and millions like them the chance of a better future. But as a member of the government, he's actively pushed through policy that stop people from being able to come to the UK and rebuild their lives. From the Rwanda policy that will deport refugees thousands of miles away to defending the hostile environment, Rishi Sunak is a complete utter fraud. This again shows the limitations of representation politics. Having black and brown people at the top does not mean that the lives of black and brown people in the UK and across the world will be better. In fact, they have gotten worse. The Tories are the party of the 1% and they will always do the bidding of the 1%. We inherited a bunch of formulas from the Labour Party that shoved all the funding into deprived urban areas. Uh, then they, you know, that needed to be undone. I started the work of undoing that. 
Things are bleak and there often feels like there is no hope, but like the Liverpool anthem goes, at the end of a storm, there's a golden sky. Across the country, we're seeing workers organise across so many sectors, whether it's the RMT to barristers, cleaners, teachers and nurses. What this is showing us is that another way is possible when workers stand up, fight back and hold this government to account. Whoever wins the Tory leadership race, we know that our media will not hold them to account. That's why it's so important to support independent media like Double Down News, so give them some money if you can to their Patreon. Join the future of journalism, join Double Down News on Patreon. So, oh. Zara Sultana basically said everything that, you know, in the article, you know, it's ever said, but yeah, basically another, essentially another aristocrat, you know, probably in the worst possible way, is now leading uh, the country in the UK in a time of crisis right now. Um, no, I don't want to play again. No, oh, you got it. Uh, you got it. Oh, that was the end. I think I think. Actually... Yes, that was it. Oh, I think I did put up another tweet here, but that's okay. So, yeah. any last thoughts? Uh, I mean, it feels like same old, same old for the most part. Like, you know, the fact that this is an unelected individual is what's insane. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think like it's crazy how rich that guy is to be in yeah. office for one yeah. on top of the policies he's of course done just like politicians here who are celebritized, you know, so yeah, actually I I'm going to read this tweet. Um, Go ahead. I tried to put it up before. Um, I guess I needed to review it. But uh, friend to the show, DJ Joe Nice, uh, who's actually in the UK right now, mm. uh, he sent this tweet. Uh, so I'm just going to read it. Richie Sunak has the elitism, classism, and identity politics of Kamala Harris, the austerity, dislocation from the working class, and political power of Obama, and the unearned rise to leadership with the ups obscene corporate wealth of Trump. Well, I can argue even more than that. Uh, and it's more legit than Trump. <laughs> the two, the UK has two years of this. Ouch. So, um, you know, so yeah, I think basically he fits every mold that you could possibly get. He's Indian, you know, like, which fits the identity politics thing. He has the money in ridiculous amount. You know, and then like, but yeah, very much Obama esque. Like, I definitely get those Obama, even like, um, uh, the Trudeau vibes from him. You know, um, yeah. But I think it'll be interesting. If well, we'll see how long he lasts. But I think you know, like, the one positive thing could be that this could lead the you know, the working class in the UK to actually move, you know, in terms of really organizing. And I think in light of the horror stories we're hearing in the UK, just as far as energy costs, you know, like food costs going up, you know, like, um, and winters in the UK aren't our shit, you know? Yeah. So, you know, so really, I think this could be, I think it'll be very interesting to watch. And I think this might be I think we definitely need to watch this. I think in terms, I think in the US, you know, just seeing how the UK responds to Sunak being a uh, prime minister and just seeing one, how long he lasts, you know, because again, this trust was only there for a few weeks. Like a week, you know? yeah. So let's see, like, it's not guaranteed that Sunak is even gonna last two years uh, until the next, gener uh, next general election, but also, It'll be interesting to see like how the working class responds, you know, to him, given, you know, the things that they've said, you know, to him on social media and obviously knowing of his wealth and them just being like very nonchalant about it and almost kind of throwing it in, you know, the population's face of how rich they are, you know, like, even though I think they tried to downplay it a lot, but we'll see how much they really are for the working class. So we'll it'll definitely be an interesting, you know, 
I don't want to say two years, but we'll give two years just to see. Sure. Like if he makes it that long. 